Welcome, um, everybody, uh, back to Siegel Talks here at the Martin E. Siegel Theater Center, the Graduate Center CUNY in New York City at the City University. It's uh, the end of uh, week four. We um, reacted fast at the Siegel Center, as we do often, and uh, we created a series so we could hear voices uh, from uh, artists and uh, uh, workers in the field of theater and performance and uh, to tune in how they are experiencing the moment, uh, what they are thinking, what is on their mind, how they are influenced by the moment and what the future might bring, should bring, will bring and what is uh, the way they deal with a situation that's unprecedented, um, especially of course also in New York City um, while we are talking, people are in hospitals under respirators, people are dying, uh, we have more dead people than countries in the world, or most of them. So something went really, really wrong. Uh, we just had a call with South Africa where Basil Jones says things are looking kind of okay, the government is doing the right things, we trust them. And, uh, and so it's stunning things. We heard from India where 500,000 people left on foot, New Delhi trying to get out, some prepared to walk a thousand kilometers. So we heard from uh, from Egypt where the government offered a dollar, $15 for an artist for the next three, four months as a support. And they had to call into one national hotline where there is one phone number only and fill out 10 pages. Uh, we heard from Germany and France uh, where the situation uh, um, is different. It's supported, but everybody uh, is missing what makes life life. Uh, when we know when we are alive, when the stone is a stone and white is white and black is black, we know that when we look at uh, the stage and uh, one of the uh, uh, artists, contemporary global artists who gives us meaning uh, on stage, who reworks the classic, but also reacted uh, right away to his own country and to his situation in the US where he studied his Guillermo Calderon from uh, Chile, his country went through tremendous changes, has seen uh, uh, many, many things we have never experienced uh, in America or in Europe, uh, which might be closer to quarantine um, when he grew up, uh, uh, then it's now it's, things have changed there and they are changing again. So we are tuning in now to Latin America. It's been a well, while, we should have done it earlier. Lula Arias will uh, uh, come soon. We had contact with Sabine Berman from Mexico, Lula, of course, from Argentina. But uh, Guillermo, um, welcome to Siegel Talks. Thank you so much for having me. No, really, it's a, it's a big, big, uh, big honor to um, have you here. You have been at the Seagull, you have been in New York. You actually also studied for a while at the Great Center. I didn't even know that at the time you were here, you came to our events. Mm -hmm. um, you worked with Antje Ögel a lot, who connected us also to you at the public, with Oscar Eustace, who's gonna be on next week, with Tony Torn together. Um, Guillermo, where are you now and what time is it? It's uh, the same time as uh, New York City. This is um, noon and I'm in Santiago, Chile. So this is where you live, their home is at the moment? Yes, I've been staying here for the last um, year or so, yeah. So tell us a bit, what's going on in Santiago de Chile? Well, um, maybe I should start with the, with the dead. We're hitting maybe 180 this uh, weekend and um, the, there are people um, diagnosed with the virus um, is hitting around uh, 12,000, which is, acceptable, I guess, because it means that um, the health system is not collapsing. Um, but of course, we're really skeptic about the numbers. And we know that the, um, the health system is already um, a collapse system. So um, ideas of um, collapse are, um, I don't know, it's, um, everything is debatable right now. Um, we have been under curfew uh, uh, for a while and under quarantine, which is different. The whole country is under curfew, meaning that you can't leave your home between 10 p.m. and and five in the morning. And also- um, Curfew means not on the street, not driving cars, nothing. Exactly, exactly. You get, if you, if you step out of your house, you get detained by the police. But um, there's also, um, different regions or sections of the country have been under quarantine, meaning this um, city has not been under quarantine um, as a city. Only different um, municipalities within the city have been under curfew. And it's interesting phenomenon because the, the illness arrived here, the virus arrived here through the, the upper class neighborhoods because it basically came here for people coming back from vacation in Europe. Uh, 
could, of course, nobody go, not everyone goes to um, vacation in Europe, right? So the people who arrived here um, got it first, and then they passed it on to the people who work for them. So now the curfew is being um, ended. I mean, the, I mean, the quarantine is being um, left in the sort of upper class neighborhoods, and they are uh, putting under quarantine the working class neighborhoods, which means that again, all the people that got it from the those um, um, those rich neighborhoods are not getting it, and that's different because. Uh, it's, it's a very segregated uh, city and we have a whole different uh, health system for the rich and the poor. So now we are really afraid that um, the, the working class health system is not going to be able to deal with, um, with the virus in those neighborhoods. So, so it would mean like if New York City terms Upper West Side could go out and no quarantine, but Queens or Brooklyn or the Bronx, there's quarantine, people are not allowed to go out. Is that true? Is that right? Yes. Exactly, exactly. And, um, and, um, and think, and, and, if, uh, if, uh, in the Upper West Side, everyone had private insurance and in Queens, nobody had private insurance. So they have Do different have set of, insurance? set of hospitals and different set of uh, doctors for them, Dif uh, different, um, sort of, um, um, neighborhoods in, in the city. Mm, sorry, to, do you have health insurance as an artist? How is the situation among artists in Chile? Well, it's really dire. It's um, uh, the um, theater uh, um, in Chile is always a semi-professional activity, meaning that the people who do it um, go to um, four years um, university sort of career. I mean, um, they study for four years in college to become theater artists. So when they do it, they do it uh, professionally. They do it to the higher standards. But the reality of working in this theater is um, amateur, meaning that uh, people do it uh, mostly on the side. They have a day job and they do it um, during the evenings when they are free to, to work after their day job. So there's funding, of course, from the government, but that's not enough to sort of um, uh, let people um, dedicate themselves uh, fully to creating theater. So um, people teach and they, of course, wait tables as they, as they do everywhere in the world. But um, of course, wages are low and there's no, not, there's no jobs for everyone. So people um, who, are, uh, who you see on stage working professionally are usually uh, uh, working uh, under the poverty line because uh, ticket sales, um, well, tickets are really uh, inexpensive and and the wages you get from performing in theater are not a lot uh, uh, so people never never truly become um uh sort of citizens in in the complete sense of the world they're always sort of uh, um marginalized and sort of pushed into sort of um a working class situation in which they can't abandon so in a way, this situation has, uh, um, has shown that this, um, this situation in which we find ourselves now is not much different from the one we were living before. Now we're not allowed basically to show our stuff because theaters are closed, but we were not making a lot of money um, then anyway. So people, the, 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 um, the situation of, of, of theater just hasn't changed much. I, I don't know if I'm, if mm -hmm. I'm being clear there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it was dire before and it's, and it's dire now. So, um, however, um, uh, well, th there's a big story to this because this, um, this uh, coronavirus crisis hit the country, Chile and Santiago, especially where the, most of the theater activity is, um, in March, uh, late March, early, early April, uh, I wanna say mid-March, right? Um, but 
in the context of basically a social revolution, political revolution in the country, which started in mid-October. So in mid-October, uh, massive protests uh, started um, happening yep. all over the country, something that uh, we have we had never seen before in Chile. And it was a big revolt against um, neoliberalism and, and capitalism in its um, neoliberal form, of course, and um, against the government. Because um, once the protests began um, sort of taking over the streets of, of the most cities in the country, the reaction of the government was um, extremely violent. Immediately, they declared a, a curfew, and then they brought the military out to the streets to control the population, which was um, really shocking because we hadn't seen that since the since the time of Pinochet in the 70s and 80s. So this was really sort of a, a nightmare um, come true. And the actual uh, police began uh, behaving uh, in a very um, sort of criminal way, shooting at protesters and killing dozens, and also taking the eyes, eyes out, out of people's faces. Right? So for some reason, we don't know exactly why, maybe they received orders, maybe they didn't, but they started shooting their guns to the heads and faces of protesters. Um, and they took, I don't, I don't keep up with the count, but I know that more than 400 protesters have lost their um, eyes. And a couple of them have, have lost both eyes. So they aim at the head, they shoot at the head in order to take people's uh, eyes out, mostly young people. Which is really interesting because uh, they're not killing them, but they are maiming them, right? And um, for us, uh, we see that as a form of torture. Because during the dictatorship, torture was really effective uh, means of control. Um, the protest and the political activity of the people opposing the dictatorship. And torture is um, it's, um, a great sort of um, control scheme, I guess, because it terrorizes not only the person who's being tortured, but all the circle, right, family and friends become um, immobilized. And, and actually, they, it's really hard for them to go back to protest because of the the horror, the terror is so striking and so runs so deep in everyone's um, um, conscience and body that you can't sort of um, rise again to fight. Right now, they're not allowed to do that. Um, they do it anyway in, in certain police stations, but um, now taking out people's eyes uh, serves that function, very similar to torture. Once a person loses uh, their eye, it, um, it sends shocks with shocks, uh, shock waves of horror. And um, young people think twice about going outside to protest again. And of course they can get away with it. Um, no no uh, policeman has been sent to uh, justice because of um, this, um, this kind of crime. So this happened, this started happening again in mid-October. Just last they, year, they, last year, yes, October. Yeah. Last year, yes, actually uh, October the 18th. So the government be behaved very criminally. They couldn't control the protest. The protest didn't stop. They set up the curfew to, um, to control the population and to, and to uh, let uh, basically the police and the, and the, and the military um, uh, roam the cities. And then the, um, the protests, the protests kept kept going, and they became more intense in March, because um, here in the southern hemisphere we have our, our summer break in, in February, so protests didn't go away, but they just slowed down just a little bit. But when people came back to students came back to class in in um, in March, every everything started sort of happening again. Uh, people taking over the, um, the subway system, people uh, um, uh, burning tires in every street corner, stopping traffic, stopping, stopping the economy, basically. Uh, unions um, um, striking and marching towards the center of the city, like a full-blown full revolution. I'm talking about March, and then this happens. The coronavirus happens. 
So the coronavirus stops the protests because people are not allowed to go out anymore and they don't want to because they don't want to get um, the virus. So it's very um, sad for the protest because we were, um, we, it was, it was uh, the one exciting thing that had happened in, in, in our country for a long time because we were being sort of, um, we had sort of um, a kind of a humiliating situation in which our country was uh, under Pinochet, sort of the laboratory of um, neoliberalism because uh, during the 70s and 80s, he had uh, the government there had a free range to um, impose all the neoliberal experiments in, in our country because they didn't have a um, um, opposing uh, parliament to deal with. So after that, um, we were uh, basically very um, passive. We didn't quite rebel as a country. And that was really, really um, actually sad. We didn't uh, until we have a sense of um, um, collective um, drive or even ambition. There was a sense of a shared um, sadness, I guess, for being completely submitted to this horrible system. So now, basically, people were uh, taking over the streets and there was a sense of uh, collective action. We're finally taking over. We're finally doing something for ourselves. And that's when the coronavirus hit. So the protest is over. And the government, which is basically ready to, to give up and maybe sort of to call elections or to um, have the president um, uh, resign, they take uh, back control. And they set up a new curfew, but not now, uh, not because of protests, but because of the coronavirus. So for us, it's a weird thing because um, curfew, of course, we knew before from two months ago when we were protesting. So this is a new kind of curfew. We know actually we have some sort of experience on this because we were sort of trapped in the houses two months ago. So in because October they... you had a curfew. Yes. Yes. <clears throat> Tell us and, about and now, the curfew. Yeah, and now it's a new curfew. So the well, same time weird. was it the same time ten o'clock till five or? Yes. Well, sometimes it started earlier during the protest. Maybe sometimes at seven or eight or even at nine. It was it was the more, most strange thing because in the summer, um, um, sun goes out. At, at, and around, I want to say nine, nine thirty. So when the curfew starts at seven, you're basically are trapped in your house with um, full daylight and doing a heat wave, um, not able to go out. Very strange. As the military trucks um, um, crisscross the the city, and uh, military helicopters um, fly over your house. It's um, eerie, and um, you feel, um, of course, it's very dystopian. You feel, um, you feel like you're basically in the middle of a sort of science fiction film or something, which is something that is very common now. We all feel like some sort of a fictional dystopia. Um, I don't know, for, for me, it was really eerie to see the helicopters, the sound, mm -hmm. the way they, they fly low in order to um, sort of make sure you hear the rumble and you, and you feel like the, um, everything um, shaking inside your house. It's a show of, um, of power. Yeah. Um, it's a relief in a way because you see the system um, showing its true colors. Um, it's very, uh, everything becomes really clear and transparent. So in a way, it's a moment of honesty for everyone involved. Yeah, so I keep, I keep thinking about people wanting to go back to normal. But for us here, normal was a revolution. So when we say we're going to go, go, we want to go back to normal, we mean we need to go, we want to go back to the normalcy of revolution because that revolution as complicated and difficult and bloody as it was, 
it was a revolution about collective action and a sense of um, future and even optimism. This is a, it is really stunning to hear and um, to, to take that all in. And uh, did you participate? You as a director and playwright, your, your work has been shown. It was at the public theater in New York and Berlin uh, and so many countries around the world. And you say you still have, a, of course, a hard time in, 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 in uh, Santiago uh, to, to be produced. But you as an artist, how were you involved in that revolution? What did you do as an artist? Well, um... As much as we could, and, I, and I'm speaking collectively because, um, well, what happened immediately after this revolution started was that theaters closed because um, you couldn't go to the theater because the theater was basically, I mean, the, the city itself was, um, was closed. You couldn't go anywhere and the police were everywhere. And then the curfew happened. So theaters were closed immediately. And theater artists were immediately uh, sort of um, paralyzed in that uh, there was a collective realization that it was impossible to do theaters, theater in these circumstances. Not only because it was ethically complicated to drag people into so, sort of this bourgeois sort of um, activity of um, um, being in protected um, closed doors, engaging in some sort of a um, version of high culture, while outside there's a um, revolution in which people are dying. Of course, that's uh, that was impossible for us to to do, even if we wanted uh, to do some uh, such thing. But also because the revolution had the 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 effect of immediately um, challenging our, um, our way of doing theater or aesthetic or subject matter, everything. So I think there was a collective understanding that the only thing that we can do right now is just stop everything and go out to the streets to protest and to join the movement. Uh, we're not, we're, there was a, uh, no realization that we're, we're not going to be opening new shows anytime soon, maybe in six months or a year. So we might as well engage with this and see what it does to us. And maybe we can make a play, a show, a performance piece out of this in a year from now, after we are able to digest and come up with something worthwhile. So, um, so basically join the protest. Uh, uh, there's a routine in which you go every day or you go every Friday, you join, you get, um, you, uh, I guess the most common experience is to just um, breathe a lot of tear gas, cry a lot with that tear gas, realize that it's basically a um, chemical weapon, uh, see the violence, uh, engage in social media and see every single, um, um, video clip in which they show you the, the complete violence in which uh, the police is um, engaging, the, the, the radical violence that they are uh, using against the people. So we, uh, we did this thing in which we went out, joined the protest, do whatever we could, and then go back home and spend hours on social media seeing what other people were doing and exposing ourselves to extreme violence. And when we, when I say extreme violence, it's basically um, police cars, for example, not even thinking anymore about sort of keeping some sense of um, dignity or some sense of uh, legality to what they were doing. And basically um, pressing the gas and just running their cars against the crowd and just have people sort of fly, um, hitting people and just having people fly in the sky, fly up um, after being hit by a car. So we were exposed to, um, to that with a sense of responsibility because we can't sort of, uh, we can't look away. We have to engage by sort of engaging with the violence. It's kind of um, a citizen's duty to do so. Um, and um, wait and think and trying to figure out if theater is possible after this. 
if, if it's possible at all. This is, yeah, this is amazing. The same police that uh, executed that state power represented and, and killed people uh, took eyes out. Um, they are now on the street trying to manage the curfew, right? They are the same same uh, same soldier, same policeman. It's uh, incredible, it's unimaginable. And it also puts a lot of what we experience also in uh, in um, perspective. How do you, as a as a human, as Guillermo, uh, uh, how do you feel at the moment? What's what's going on? What's going on in your mind? How do you feel? Well, I think um, I feel very not creative at all. I think um, I think. At some point, I thought maybe this was going to be a fertile moment to just imagine theater or some sort of art for the future, something original to say about this that's going on. But um, yeah. soon enough, I realized that it was impossible. The, the, the fear for the future, the the uh, acknowledging the, the criminality of um, the people in power all over the world is so overwhelming that um, that um, I feel like I've been pushed into a corner in which I, I can only sort of um, think, trying to in, inform myself, to just trying to grasp, uh, understand what's going on. But uh, I've been sort of pushed into sort of... Um, um, uh, Passivity and a sort of a kind of an abject passivity, in which I'm completely sort of ashamed of my situation. Um, I, I'm not engaging much with people. Um, um, uh, I thought there was going to be at the beginning a lot of um, conversations, um, Zoom parties um, every evening, but I haven't been doing that at all. I think it has a, it's a more um, an experience of being um, alone, uh, worrying about the future, and trying to um, imagine a, a future of um, dystopia. Not because I want it, but because I think um, it's always better to anticipate the worst rather than to hope for the better. Uh, I'm not always like this, but I, I, I've been sort of um, push into that um, extreme. So um, yeah, so I keep I keep thinking about um, the moment in which they say, oh, listen, um, uh, uh, political rights, yeah, we're not doing that anymore because we're in a state of emergency. Uh, you, um, you know what, television, yeah, we're not going to be doing that anymore because we need to sort of allocate the resources to somewhere else. Um, 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 supermarkets, yeah, only one but run by the government. We're not doing supermarkets anymore. Gas, yeah, just bikes. We're doing bikes now. So I anticipate a, uh, a situation in which we're going to slowly and, and very bored walk into sort of a state of, um, or, of um, poverty, disconnection, and a new kind of civilization that I, I don't know. Um, what it's going to look like. I guess that that's one version of it. And the other version of it is just um, um, some sort of a uber capitalist system, um, even more authoritarian than, than the one we already know. <clears throat> Do you feel your government listened um, at all to the street protests? Are there signs now where you feel, uh, I mean, it was, as you said, it looked like you know, elections would happen. Now with the corona, which is so strikingly similar to uh, authoritarian rule imposed by an uh, authoritarian government. But do you feel now there is uh, perhaps some trust that could be put into um, the government? Is there anything where you're saying, yes, maybe something will change for the better how it is as it exists, or do you feel it is hopeless? No, I think that they are, they are as criminal as they were before. Um, criminal in a very sort of um, <laughs> cool way, because the same guys who were killing you actively sort of sending out people to kill uh, the protesters are now saying, um, we're, we're here to protect your health so you don't die, please stay at home. 
so, so that's very, I don't know, um, extreme whitewashing um, to the point in which it's almost um, laughable. But I think the changes come from the um, a sort of a, a changing the people, how people see their power. For example, uh, when this crisis started, they wanted to keep the um, shopping malls open. And immediately, all the, the people who work in retail at those shopping malls, the, um, the employees, basically stepped stepped out of their of their stores and they started clapping uh protesting and that was um very striking because those retail workers um never ever protest so i think that they got from um sense of um encouragement from the revolution before so in a way, that way of resisting the system was applied to what happened next, which was the coronavirus crisis. So I expect more of that um, for the future. And again, all the people who were protesting uh, five months ago are can't wait to go back to the street again. So after this coronavirus situation is over, lifted, the vaccines are arrived, whatever, people are going to be um, Killing the streets and protest by protesting by the millions. So the the last protest we have was the um, International uh, Women's Day on uh, uh, March um, um, uh, eighth. I guess it was the march happened a day before. Um, a, a million and a half people, women, marched in the streets, protesting the government and and asking for justice and uh, asking for the stop stop the, stopping the violence against women. So that's that's the strength of the movement, and that's not going to go um, away at all. And by the way, I should add that the movement did uh, accomplish something: that um, uh, there's going to be an election to um, write a new constitution. There's going to be an election to vote for or against um, uh, writing a new constitution for the country, and that's a big deal. Um, and that's happening in October. So whatever happens, well, the, the, the date was originally set for April, but now they moved it to October because of the virus. So that's happening. Whatever happens, there's going to be a new constitution in Chile, and it's going to be um, a very new world and, and a very new country. Um, but um, um, yeah, you know, you know how it is. You can be optimistic and pessimistic at the same time. And make that kind of um, your um, identity. Mm -hmm. um, as a theater artist, um, with the work you um, you put up, the work you imagined uh, uh, as a symbolic uh, way, as a way of uh, of a real way uh, on stage, um, as portraying the world, but perhaps also with the call to change it, as Milo Rao said, uh, that what you, you and others are doing now. Um, do you feel the revolution, but perhaps also the corona now, is something changing inside your your thinking about your practice? For, or do you feel like your Thomas Ostermeyer says, I feel I'm just hit by a bus. I can't really put it into words. But do you feel there's an adjustment that things might be approached differently when, when this is over? And it will be over. Things, nothing lasts forever. So for the good or for the bad, but this will be over. Yeah. Is there something that... Well, something really interesting happened because we, I was doing with, with a lot of people, my generation and younger, we were doing these political plays for a long time in Chile. We we're sort of foreshadowing the revolution. Yeah. To the point in which we were becoming uh, boring, right? Because we're repeating this message over and over again. This guy's going to fall down on us. The, the system is completely unfair. Um, we have no justice. We are under a dictatorship under other name. We were going on and on and on about this. Um, some people were maybe um, saying with some sort of a justification, why didn't you stop it? Move on to some other subject matter, you know, because that's all news. Um, the country moved on, you know. And we would never shut up. Um, and we became even more radicalized as, as we 
as, as, as years went by. And then th this revolution happens. We were sort of um, vindicated in a way, but revolution stole our, uh, immediately stole our thunder because it was so big and it was so uh, such a popular movement that our theater became immediately old because we were seeing the future and sort of uh, again announcing the announcing the revolution. But when, when the, once the revolution uh, arrives, um, you can't see the future anymore. You become part of the past. The people who announced it, but we are not um, um, foreseeing anything. And I'm talking about our subject matter and also about our aesthetic as well. So we were we we're completely stunned. Yeah, a, a big bus hit us, but at least we had the revolution and the revolution had like a, a sort of beautiful um, artistic component. People doing graphic arts were just covering the city and sort of the most beautiful art, graphic art, graffiti that you've ever seen. Um, there were performance everywhere. There was music on the streets. It was just beautiful, but we were stunned anyway. And then something really interesting happened, which was that a feminist group from Valparaíso called Las Tesis creating, created a, a piece of performance uh, called El Violador Eres Tú, or The Rapist uh, Is You, which is something um, that was performed by a group of, um, I want to say, 100 women, 200 women on the streets and everywhere. And the performance was so, so successful that it was repeated all over the world, including in New York City and, and most cities in the US and, and Europe. But, but I'm talking about everywhere in the world. And, the, and this was a piece of performance art. Basically, it was um, a dance in which, um, I can't really do it right now, but it's basically, I, don't, I wouldn't know how to do it, but it's basically, uh, they repeat a, um, a little a speech with um, some sort of um, sing song um, as they move their, um, their um, arms and legs representing um, different situations of oppression, of oppression and then sort of um, fighting back against authority. I'm talking about, about the way they use their body. But it, it's one of those um, sort of um, short dance pieces that um, you can learn rather easily and that you can do on the streets. And it's, and, and it's for, for women, right? For women to, to perform as a group. And this was really interesting because as they explained later, this group made out of, um, of women, they were preparing a play in which they were um, going to use this little choreography. But then since the revolution started, they couldn't do it. So they took that little choreography to the street and then it got fire and then it was done by people all over the country and then all over the world. And, it's, and, it, ha and it has a very sort of st strong political content because they are accusing um, men of actually um, being the rapist, but not only men, but the state with capital letters and the police of uh, being the actual rapist. Uh, not only the, in the sense of the actual rape, but also in the sense of sort of um, raping um, society as a whole with, um, with oppression. And this was done collectively it's incredibly strong, it's incredibly catchy, it's incredibly beautiful, and it's incredibly theatrical. And once we saw that, we saw the theater of the future. This is it. This is what we were uh, sort of hoping for. Um, this is here to save theater, right? Um, a theater that doesn't happen inside the um, our conventional theaters, it's for everyone to be done. It, it has a striking political uh, um, uh, statement and it's done by the people and it's beautiful and it's joyful and it's political and it's, um, and it's done by women. So it was um, basically the most hopeful and beautiful, beautiful thing that I've seen. Um, coming out of this. So I think I saw the future is not, maybe not done by me. Maybe um, my role is to go back to my old ways and trying to find a way from there. But at least uh, I know that uh, 
some people are taking over in the most uh, creative and be beautiful way, a more interesting way. So again, that thing is now dormant, but I expect it to come back. Mm -hmm. Looking back, I mean, you did the great piece, Villa, about the, the, the villa where the Museum of Torture, you know, should, how what form it should take. It's a wonderful uh, discussion on how to think and how to think about things at a different perspective. But also then you did never, where actually actors were rehearsing, Chekhov had died, a revolution is on the street. But a play like Never, where it deals with revolution, <clears throat> do, you, do you, could you write that again right now or do you feel something uh, is different? Yeah, something is different because uh, the inspiration for Neva was um, a problem with the ethics of uh, doing theater, something that uh, I've talked about this here before. In a country so violent and so um, with so much inequality and, and oppression as, as Chile, it's really difficult to um, get away with um, charging a lot of money and doing a play inside a beautiful theater. Um, every aesthetic sort of preoccupation or concern or maybe um, engaging in this um, collective act of going to the theater to some sort of cultural enjoyment, it's um, rather shameful or could become rather shameful. So I wrote a metaphorical play, Neva, in which um, uh, Chekhov's widow, um, Olga Knipe, was basically rehearsing a play while outside the, outside the Tsar was uh, killing people during the 1905 revolution in, in St. Petersburg. So just to, just to, again, to play with this idea of um, performing something while outside people are being killed. Uh, and the play was really successful for me as a, as a writer and director because uh, I think I engaged the subject in the way that I wanted to. But for that to happen, for that um, idea to sort of work, theater has to be happening. So when I did this play, theater was actually happening. People were sort of um, going to the theater and, and filling uh, the seats of the house, right? Now there's no theater. So there's no... Um, there's no um, bourgeois theater getting away with an aesthetic concern and ignoring what's going on in the, street, in the streets. So I guess now the equivalent of this completely sort of um, bourgeois engaging with sort of an escapist uh, um, art or beauty is, I guess, staying at home and watching uh, I don't know, television or, or uh, quality television, uh, which I guess it would be a little, a, little bit, a little bit unfair because it's not like we have a lot of options other than that. But um, um, I guess a play like that um, has lost um, traction because of the fact that we actually don't have theater now and we won't have for a while. <clears throat> How do you spend your day? Tell us a bit. How do you when you get up? What do you what do you do now? In the in, in as a writer, such a brilliant mind and director, and then you went through the revolution where theaters were closed. Now it's closed again. There's curfew. So how do you how do you pass a day? Well, I garden? most of the day is taking care of um, of a toddler. That's it. I take care of the toddler all day, and then at night I have two hours for myself in which I basically um, check the internet and try to write a little bit. And, and then my mind completely um, goes and then I have time for some email and that's it. I'm not watching movies, I'm not reading. I'm not doing anything other than sort of um, reading the news, reading what's going on with, with the pandemic and trying to catch hopeful news about the possibility of a treatment or, of a, or a vaccine. And I have tried to catch bits of um, the show of unit shows that they are putting up on the website. Mm -hmm. That's, that has been my, my, um, my biggest um, sort of um, 
moment of pleasure. And I am teaching a couple of classes in the university. I'm teaching a class in uh, theater uh, directing and also a class, um, a writing class. Writing class is, I, I think, more tolerable, but the situation of teaching over uh, a screen is, um, it's fine. I mean, people are willing to make it work, but it can last, um, I don't know, 30 minutes. After 30 minutes, you start losing your engagement and your concentration. So it's not truly productive. And I think the same, uh, and the directing class is just, um, uh, I don't know, I think it's uh, underwhelming because <laughs> um, of course they're practical class. You have to be actually engaging with students and directing on stage. I'm making them direct on stage. Of course, most, mostly discussing theater and discussing film, but we're not doing much directing. We have tried to direct uh, over Skype a little bit, which feels um, current because a lot of people are doing uh, performance, even plays on, um, on Skype and, um, and Zoom. What do so you think about we, that, doing plays and performances on Skype and Zoom? Well, well, I guess, People have been doing it here um, really successfully, I guess. So they did a couple in which they they um, they sold 1,000 tickets for one and then 500 tickets for the other one, which is unprecedented. And they were charging, I want to say, the $5, which is a lot of money. So um, it was successful and people are seeing this as a sort of a, a fine alternative to not working. And some people are even looking into developing this um, online play thing as a, exploring uh, possibilities for it, right? Uh, maybe this, the, the sort of a Zoom conversation is just um, the first stage and maybe they're going to come up with something really interesting. I'm not interested in that myself. I'd rather do, uh, I'd rather do, um, 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 uh, radio plays or something like that. But um, I my, my criticism is that the people who are um, succeeding on this are people who were already well known and really well established. So people who are already famous, maybe are people who are can sort of invite um, uh, a lot of um, ticket sales they can get a lot of tickets there because they are already famous. So in a way, the people who were already well positioned in society in theater are getting the most out of uh, this uh, movement. And the people who were doing um, theater um, struggling and that are not really well known are not going to get much um, economic reward out of, out of this. So um, I think it's going to play out. I think it's... Um, in my case, I, I can't engage again more than 30 minutes with the screen. So I think uh, it might get old pretty soon, but I'm not going to say bad things about it because I don't mm. want to stop sort of legitimate sort of uh, things that theater artists might be exploring for artistic reasons and economic reasons. Mm. So when you write in those two hours, at what time is it, and what do you write about? Well, I have um, I have assignments. I'm um, I'm writing for film and television. So you did the Pablo um, Neruda screenplay, right? Uh, this yes. is your latest film. Mm -hmm. Yes. So you write on commissions at the moment. Yes, and I'm and I'm writing um, a script for myself because I want to direct a film in the near future, whenever this comes back, if it does. And I want to um, develop another play with my company because um, in my company, everyone is going a little bit crazy right now for obvious reasons. You can do so much yoga online before it gets um, um, not fun anymore. So we're putting together a play, um, which is going to be um, a sequel to a play we did before, which is called uh, Mata Luna. What is a play in which we we are basically trying to um, free a friend on a, on, of us who is in prison right now, and this is reality. Um, 
So we did a play to try to um, um, convince the, author the, the authorities to give him um, um, uh, to release him, um, to basically to start a new uh, sort of um, trial or maybe get a sort of um, a pardon from the government. We have failed so far with the first play we did in collaboration with um, How Theater in Berlin. Um, it's a well international production called Mateluna, which is the last name of this friend of us who is in prison right now. And now we're doing a new play about him because we really, really want to release him. He, um, he has called me a couple of times from prison. He's very scared because he is, um, of course, in a sort of very dangerous situation. Because as we, as we know, um, um, prisons have been um, completely devastated by this uh, virus. So he's very afraid that he's going to get it. And also in Chile at least, uh, prisoners have been stage, staging um, riots inside prisons to be released and, or to have um, access to, to some sort of um, medical care. So he's afraid that he's going to get involved in some sort of uh, riot and then he might get the virus as well. So he, he has called me twice in the, um, in the last um, month, I guess. And um, we're, we're doing another play for him in order to release him. Um, this is uh, for us as well. And we don't know how, what form it's going to take. Maybe we're going to film it and maybe show it online if we need to show it before this, um, the situation is over. So mm -hmm. that's 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 part of the work. But that's um that's um, um at this stage is more uh, meeting than uh, than writing. Mm -hmm. Do you feel uh, in Chile kind of how is the situation? Do you feel isolated? Are you contacts to Latin American colleagues in other countries or to Europe or America? Do you feel people pay attention? To the situation, um, yes. Before before um, this, um, um, I mean, during the, the revolution, I get a lot of emails and a lot of uh, attention from other from other people. There was a theater festival here. A lot of people came to see the protests and to see the theater. And I gave a couple of uh, interviews to um, international. Um, um, websites, um, including HowlRound, uh, telling about the situation in Chile. And a lot of friends wrote to just find out what was going on. There was a lot of concern. And I was really pleased by that. And I realized how connected we all are. But now that we all have the um, coronavirus and we're going through the same situation, I realized that there's, um, there's um, a situation in which one doesn't have to explain anything to anyone. Because this um, situation has um, unified in such a way, unified, unified us all in such a way that we don't need to explain to each other anymore what's going on. So um, I've been talking with friends in Europe and we don't even talk about the virus. We go immediately into personal stuff or other stuff because we don't need to, to tell each other yeah, I've been, I've been at home trapped for six days. Today I'm going to take a walk. I don't have food or I've been eating too much. I can't watch uh, um, TV anymore. It's making me sick. Um, you know, that kind of conversation is just taken for granted because we're all going through the same. So we just go into sort of a more real stuff. And also, I guess we, we try to keep up um, a sense of um, humor as well because it's, it's um, basically the only thing we have left. So we might as well use it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. this is uh, <clears throat> incredible. I hope uh, that one day you will actually get your own theater, have your own building, and um, that you can uh, work uh, in, in a good way that there's support for the, uh, for the artists. I mean, you, you say you work with students, you teach uh, in this moment now, what do you, what do you tell the artists? And what do you tell your friends? What do, is advice how to get through this or what to keep in mind? Well, I tell them 
two things. One, that um, we already experienced the death of theater in Chile because after the coup happened in 1973, uh, there was a curfew for years and theater was uh, basically killed. And for some reason, theater survived and then it became a thing, mostly through um, street performance in the 80s. And then it became a big thing in the mid 80s and the, and the 90s. And theater came back and it, it did wonderful, beautiful things. So theater has a way of, sort of surviving the most dire sort of um, situation. So I basically, when I talk to people who are in their early 20s or even younger than that, that they're going to go through the death of theater and they are going to revive it themselves. And they're going to be talking about the revolution and about the coronavirus for 40 years in their theater. And it's going to transform it completely. And it's going to be born from them because for me, there's going to be a, a before and, and after this crisis, but for them, it's going to be the starting point. And that theater is going to look completely different. It's going to be awe-inspiring and it's going to be beautiful, but it's only, um, only, only them are going to be able to, to do it. So basically, I guess I'm terrorizing them with assigning them a lot of responsibility. You know, basically you are the ones who are going to save the world. Uh, they're going to save theater by, by um, inventing it again. Um, but I, I, uh, I believe it. I mean, I, I know, I hope I have a role myself in that sort of rebirth, but I think ultimately it's going to be the role of people who, um, who are starting um, riding this uh, wave. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And so I, if I understand this, you cannot read um, anything at the moment or, but do you, or if you do read, what do you read? Do you listen to something? Is there something that were you connected to which you perhaps even knew before, but now it's kind of a different or something new. Well, this is a thing. Um, so I told you about my toddler situation. So mm -hmm. before this, I wasn't, I wasn't um, um, engaged with television at all. And I didn't let my, my kids watch um, screens at all. But since we're trapped now, we are, in order to save our sanity, we're turning on the, the, the computer and watching, um, I don't know, those videos for kids. And I've been engaging with um, television for children and it's just the most wonderful thing. I thought it was just violence and horrible stuff, but it's just beautifully done and, and a pure joy. So I've been enjoying that, really. This is this is new, and that's that's given me um, a lot of uh, optimism, I guess, and and respect for that sort of um, uh, creation. I've been um, I've been um, following closely um, uh, the um, U.S. elections, primaries, and and what's going on there, which is a spectacle in itself. It's terrifying. So that's, um, of course, I read the, the usual, the expected stuff, like, I don't know, Jacobin and but current affairs and sometimes the paper of record. But um, I, I keep very engaged with what's going on in the US, politically speaking. And that gives me a sense of doom, but also a sense of sort of um, uh, reality, being actually living in reality. And um, I am, um, also, um, also, I am listening to um, a lot of um, um, electronic music, abstract electronic music from the 60s and 70s. I think um, there's a, a sense of beauty, beauty in, in that sort of abstraction and also um, there's a numbing quality, I guess, because uh, it um, is so overwhelming and so strange and so different from everything that it sort of uh, has the quality of quieting your mind in, in, in a way that um, no meditation has able to do for me yet. Mm -hmm. so I guess that's my, that's my work music and, and my meditation music as well. So... Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's my, my cultural uh, consumption, I guess. And, and of course, 
no cable, no television, and no um, no uh, broadcast news at all. It's incredible for my incredible. for my own sanity. Mm, that you also switch between shows on television and the ultraviolet images from the revolution. Yeah. Um, you listened, I guess, Brian Eno and uh, work like this, who said his music is um, as ignorable as it is interesting and that it balances right. it out. <laughs> and, um, <clears throat> and it is, yeah. So uh, Guillermo, really, um, you are one of the artists uh, where we do say uh, why we need to hear about it. Uh, artists who've been on the right side of history, right side of progressive justice, and on the right side of also what's right. And uh, it's also you put your uh, your body into the work. As uh, Pasolini said, we all should be doing throwing our bodies into the lives. Uh, when you stop doing theater, but we're participating in the revolution. And uh, and really, uh, we all think uh, about you. Uh, you're part of our uh, big global theater community, and your work is extremely important. And uh, please uh, do do know that Chile has been on the minds for many many reasons uh, of of, of every, everyone. Um, to our audience, I uh, hope you will be able to um, listen in also next week. Uh, as I said, as far as we know, we are the only institution, theater institution in New York and in the US, perhaps also New York who produces a new meaningful content every day. And uh, just hearing uh, from Guillermo it just shows why it is important that we, uh, that we hear and listen to these uh, to these voices. We have also significant artists uh, as Guillermo for next week. We have the great Rimini uh, company, uh, Stefan Daniel and Helgard will be uh, with us. Guy Regis uh, Jr. from Haiti um, will talk about the uh, situation. Um, and there, uh, Jalila Bakar from Tunisia, who's a great leader, one of the most successful, maybe most significant writers in, in the Arab world. Uh, Peter Sellers uh, um, will also uh, join us and uh, We'll, we'll talk about his work and, and life and how he gives meaning. And then we have Oscar Eustace, who runs the great public theater where you also did your work, and Tony Torn, who runs this tiny small theater out of his home, his, from his father, a uh, beautiful space. And so they both will give us views of what's happening in, in New York City and their take on it. So I um, can really thank you, thank you listeners for taking time. I know how busy these days are and how much content is out there and uh, everything, but uh, I think for or it is also like Guillermo, it's good to know that uh, people are listening, that uh, we care. And um, then we have uh, um, more questions uh, that uh, uh, will keep with us. Again, Guillermo, thank you for coming uh, on our uh, uh, Siegel Talks. Thanks to HowlRound at Emerson College in Boston for hosting us here, and Vijay and Travis and the Siegel team, May and Sun Yang and uh, uh, Jackie and Andy who came on. So uh, thank you all. And I hope to hear from you all uh, soon again uh, in Chile. Uh, and I hope Guillermo will be back in New York or one day I'll come and visit. So uh, all my best and really uh, all my best wishes. You stay healthy and uh, and continue to do the good work. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. I'm thinking about New York City. Good. And everybody out there, uh, stay.